My name is Bill Swantner. I'm a certified Master Gardener in the state of Texas. My membership is with the Bear County Master Gardeners Association, and we'd like to welcome you to our YouTube series, All Things Gardening. In gardening, whether it's with vegetables or ornamentals, there are a couple ways of fertilizing. One is you can use a synthetic fertilizer, or you can use an organic fertilizer, or you can use some combination. In this presentation, Jay White, who is the editor of Texas Gardener Magazine, is going to share with us his passion for organic gardening. Thank you all. I, bear, I love speaking to Master Gardener Group, so, I mean, y'all gave me a little applause for driving three hours, but y'all are our bread and butter. I want you to know, I tell people, if we can't sell magazines to Master Gardeners, we're in the wrong business. So, I'll drive just about as far as it takes to talk to a Master Gardener Group. And sometimes when I get into my presentations, I get a little carried away. I am, I am a little bit hyper, I have to tell y'all. I'll be moving around and, and all of that. I feel bad for whoever is filming me. I don't know how that's going to work out, but we're going to try it. Um, Y'all, I'm serious. We love the Master Gardeners. Texas Gardener really would not exist without Master Gardeners. So I like to have some giveaways and all. We're going to give a couple of things away tonight. We'll give away a hat and we'll give away a calendar. So I'll go ahead and tell you what the trivia questions are that y'all will have to answer. And whoever answers them first, somebody will get a hat and somebody will get a calendar. Or we call it a calendar. It's actually a planning guide. So number one, issue one of Texas Gardener has the hand of a very beloved San Antonio horticulturalist on it. So whoever can tell me that will get their pick of a gift. Jimmy Parsons. Oh! <laughs> what? What? Do you want a hat or a, a planning guide? Planning guide. All right, Sally, you got a planning guide for Chad? <laughs> yes. How many people know of, of Jerry Parsons? Yeah, everybody knows Jerry Parsons. Jerry Parsons, I like funny little horticultural jokes or whatever, and Jerry Parsons told one of the, to me, the funniest. I tell non-gardening people, and they look at me like I'm crazy, but I think y'all will get it. And he said, he was giving a talk on vegetables, and he said, evidently doesn't like eggplant. And he said, well, he said, if somebody makes you grow eggplant, he said, plant it in the shade, and that way it won't set flowers. <laughs> so, I don't know why I love that. I, I thought that was pretty funny. But anyway, the second question is, what year did Texas Gardeners start? Y'all all have a magazine, so look through it, and, and we'll get back to that. So anyway, but while I'm, while I'm praising Master Gardeners, I want y'all to know that AgriLife Extension and Master Gardener has been a, a part of Texas Gardener since day one. For those of y'all that take the magazine, Sally and I, Sally and I bought the, bought the magazine from the gentleman that started it about a year and a half ago. Anyway, AgriLife Extension Master Gardeners, they have been a part of Texas Gardener since day one. When Sally and I took over the magazine, the very first two changes that we made, and I, I hope y'all have noticed, but in every issue, we feature a Master Gardener group across the state in one of their projects. And so when I came in this morning, or this afternoon, we were talking to Paula, is that correct? Yes. And she said she had really enjoyed the hydroponic article that the folks down in Gal Galveston were doing. So we do that, and y'all are coming up this year. Y'all's group will be featured in one of our magazines. And then another thing that we added was we added a section of little one, two-page uh, section in the back of the magazine that we call Little Green Thumbs. And that's written by Lisa Whittlesey. And Lisa Whittlesey uses the Junior Master Gardener curriculum to write little articles. What it's designed for, it's to encourage moms and grandmas and dads and grandpas to trade what we call screen time for green time. So, you know, a lot of times we want to take our kids out in the garden, but we don't really know what to do with them once we get out there, you know, besides letting them pick tomatoes and eat them. I mean, what do you, what do, you do with a five-year-old? Well, this little, little green thumbs, it gives you very easy things to do that you and your kids will both enjoy, okay? So we love Master Gardeners. 
Now, we also want to sell you magazines. And because of that, y'all get a 25% discount on Texas Gardener. So, this is something we only do for the Master Gardeners. It's for a one-year subscription. The price is normally $24.95, but we let y'all have it for $18.71. And the way that you access this is there's a, web, there's a link on your website, on the state site, or you can simply call or email Sally and I. So our emails are sally at texasgardener.com, jay at texasgardener.com, info at texasgardener.com, and we can send that link to you, okay? So I'm serious, y'all Y'all really are the core of our magazine, and we really do appreciate you. So tonight we're going to talk about pest-free organically, but before we get started, I want to tell a little story. I keep saying my wife, call my wife, call my wife. Let me tell you, my wife is Texas Gardener. So I get to come out here and I get to talk and tell the jokes and all of that, but Sally runs the business, okay? But let me tell you, Sally is an incredible, incredible woman, but she's not much of a gardener. She's never, she's never been much of a gardener. So I was kind of surprised a couple of years ago when she came to me, or I came home from work, and she goes, look what I bought. And I was like, what? And she bought these giant pumpkin seeds. Have y'all seen these things? You know, where you can grow an 800-pound pumpkin. I mean, I, literally, I saw a story this year where a man grew an 800-pound pumpkin, cut a hole in it, hollowed it out, and he was paddling around in his tank with it. So, so she had one of these things, and I was, I was kind of surprised, and I was like, Sally, you never wanted to grow anything in your life. I said, and I've already ruined the joke. I need to tell you, she is a retired school teacher. Okay? So I said, Sally, why do you want to grow this giant pumpkin? And she said, well, honey, I was reading a thing the other day that said if I grow this pumpkin and I cut it in half and I divide the circumference by the radius, I can make pumpkin pie. <laughs> so, so there's, there's, your, there's your bad horticultural joke of the night, okay? Now, another thing that I will be doing throughout the night is I have samples. I have Osmocoat samples. So I like to run these talks kind of as a little game show. So I'll ask questions. Y'all feel free to chime in. And when you get a right answer, I'll hand you samples. See how easy? Hey, come on. So, so I brought lots of them. So each one of these is enough to feed a five-inch pot for six months. Um, even though Osmocote is not an organic product, it is a very good product, and um, I think you'll enjoy it. Somebody told me a long time ago when I started speaking, they said, if you're not a very good speaker, you don't have much to say, give stuff away. They said, they will still like you. So, so all right, so we're going to talk about today organic pest control. Um, this is something that is kind of a special thing to me. Texas Gardener is not a 100% organic magazine. So if you read the magazine, you will occasionally see us say, put out this much compost or put out this much of a commercial or formulated fertilizer. <clears throat> but that's about all you'll see. We really are not big on using pesticides and herbicides as, if you can. As we get through it, we do understand that there are some very tough critters out there that grow in the ground and fly in the air. But we're going to talk about ways to hopefully control the pests in your garden without using harmful chemicals, okay? So, what does organic mean? Simplest answer is, organic, organic gardeners generally don't like to use synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, or pesticides. What is the most important organic principle? In my opinion, this is my opinion, if you wanted to only be partially organic, or mostly organic, or whatever, I would avoid pesticides. And we'll talk about that a little more, but here's the thing about pesticides. You know, there are synthetic pesticides out there that are incredible. It will kill everything. Who's ever sprayed malathion? Who's ever had a white fly infestation, and you went out there and you sprayed malathion? Man, it killed the white flies, didn't it? Man, it killed everything else, too, though. But anyway, so I'm not a big fan of synthetic pesticides. <coughs> so when I say organic pest control, what does that make you think? So when I say that, a lot of people say, okay, organic pest control is homemade sprays, 
Vacuuming? How many, how many people heard of vacuuming bugs? Oh, yeah. I, oh yeah, I love that. People say, take your little car vac and go out there and suck up the leaf-footed bugs and all of that. And it works, okay? And it's organic, right? Okay, and then, you know, a lot of people know about BT. That's a, a very common organic uh, pest control. But mostly when I say organic pest control, people go, that means you got a lot of bugs. Well, you don't have to. So, before we get into this, I'm going to tell you. First of all, I, I, I didn't tell you this, but my wife and I have a huge connection to San Antonio, so it was very enjoyable for us to come back. I'm from, I was in the Air Force for 10 years. I was stationed in San Antonio, four of them. My father was Air Force. Her father was Air Force. We love San Antonio. We've been here a long time. When I was down here as a young lieutenant, I had a girlfriend that really led to this presentation. Now, she was also an Air Force officer, and she was a very intelligent young lady. And we were out with her parents one time at an auction up by shirt somewhere. And so we were bored. We were standing over by a fence. We were looking at a field of cat, cattle, of young cattle. And there was a little black, white-faced calf there. And I said, oh, that's an F1 cross. And she goes, what? And I said, well, that's an F1 cross. And she goes, what, what does that mean? And I said, well, that calf, I know for a fact, came from an Angus and a Hereford. And she said, well, how do you know that? I said, well, it's genetics. It's a Punic square. It's, it's an F1 cross. And she goes, wow. She goes, I never knew there was science in agriculture. <laughs> so when she said that, I knew two things. I knew that she was not the future Mrs. White. <laughs> and then the other thing that I knew was that there are a whole lot of people out there that have some pretty skewed ideas about agriculture. And then when it gets into organics, I think people take some of those skewed ideas and some of that slips into organics, okay? So depending on how you feel about organics, some people love being all organic, some people don't. Some people make it a religion, some people do it a little bit at a little bit of time. But what we're going to talk about today, and this is what I try to talk about in every one of my talks, we're going to talk about the science in agriculture, okay? So you will never hear me tell you to put Epsom salts in your tomato holes, okay? I'll never do that, because that is not scientifically sound. It might make you feel good, and it might work for three or four people on the internet, but I can promise you that is not a sound practice, okay? In fact, it probably works to the detriment of your plants. So everything that we'll talk about today, I'm going to tell you it works, and then I'm going to tell you the science of why it works, all right? Because this is a big important thing to me, is there's a whole lot of experts out there on the internet. Have y'all ever noticed that? Okay? You know who the real experts are? Because they're on the internet too. But they're your extension agents, okay? They're your extension agents. Most of your extension agents have a PhD. At a very minimum, they have a master's degree. So not only do they love this, they have the education and the experience to back up what they're telling you. And I love those people. Those people write for us. So the way we're going to run this presentation, this is how you're going to control pests in your garden. You're going to control pests in your garden the same way that they control them in a greenhouse, okay? So we'll talk a lot about greenhouses. How, who's heard of the IPM triangle? Integrated pest man, oh, I'm supposed to be passing out. Okay, somebody tell me what the I, what IPM stands for. All right, integrated pest management. Have you ever noticed that there are a bunch of concepts like this illustrated with triangles. Yep. The IPM is not the only thing that they use, but it's very good. So as we talk about this, why is this pyramid structured the way it is? Because at the top, that should be your smallest amount. That exactly. Ready. So the base, you need some samples. <laughs> <laughs> See what happens when you participate? I wasn't going to let you get away with that. <laughs> okay. So in this triangle, the way it works, you're going to do your biggest, most important work. You're going to build the base of your triangle at the bottom, and we're going to use what we call cultural methods. Then as we move up, we'll move to mechanical, physical control. Then we'll finally move into the chemical and biological agents that you have available to you. 
All right, cultural control methods. One of the biggest things I tell people, my favorite thing when I go out and talk to people, if people ask me what is your best um, tip, your best gardening tip, it is one word, okay? It's the C word. Anybody? Well, that's an S word. It's close. Sometimes. 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 Ding, 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 ding. Okay? Compost. 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 Here. There it is. Compost, okay? If you do nothing else, if you want to be a successful organic gardener, you feed your soil. You put compost in your soil every year, at least every year, twice a year in most cases. I put it out twice a year. My wife and I grow in black gumbo, okay? But if you go to our black gumbo now, we've worked it so long, where we plant, you can run your fingers through it, okay? Um, so plant, 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 plant. As we get through this talk, I can tell you there is nothing better. The best organic pest control tip I can give you is grow healthy plants. Okay? Grow healthy plants. So I saw a clip one time, and it was an extension clip. It was very interesting. So they did a trial with tomato plants. And so they had tomato plants over here that they were not feeding correctly, they had, they had different bad things. So they had them in pots with not ideal soil, they had some that were too crowded, um, things like this. So all the things that you'll commonly see in your garden. And then they had them that were spaced appropriately, grown in healthy soil, given the right water, nutri nutrients and all that. And then they measured the amount of pests on them. Okay? It was unbelievable. I can't remember now the exact difference in it, but when they went and counted bugs on one of the crowded tomatoes, it was like 10 times as many leaf-footed bugs on that tomato as it was one that was over here by itself, properly spaced, and things like that. So if you want to have good, healthy, organic plants, feed your soil. Okay, feed your soil. Grow crops recommended for your area. Okay? How many people love forsythia? You know what forsythia is? Okay. Well, good. You, you can't grow it down here. But it, in the spring, it is a lovely yellow shrub. And when I say yellow, it's yellow. Long, straight branches. People cut them. Here, I'll, I'll be all San Antonio on you. When you go to Garden Ridge Pottery and you see their um, fake flower section and they have these long strands of yellow things, that's fake forsythia. Okay, so you may be able to grow forsythia down here, but by God, you're going to have to love it and work it and all of that. Don't try to grow forsythia down here. If you grow forsythia down here, it's not going to—it's not made for here. And when it gets weak and everything, it's going to pull in pests. So grow what is designed to grow down here. That's another very good thing. <clears throat> another one is crop rotation. Why, why do we rotate crops? So they the soil. soil. Yeah. What? The soil. Well, the minerals are may, maybe, but I'm talking about a pest problem. To fool the bugs. What is it? You're going to fool the bugs. You move them. You're going to fool the bugs. You're going to kill some bugs, too. You need some osmocote. Awesome right. <laughs> okay. So this is a good one. Sally, do we have any more planning guides? Yes. Okay. This is a good, this is a good question. Who can tell me what species of animal is the most populous species of animal on the planet? It's on every continent except Antarctica, and it plagues us every year. Nematodes! Ding, 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 ding! Give this man a planning guy. How did you know that? Good guess. Okay. <laughs> Nematodes. What, what do nematodes eat? Bugs. No. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's some that eat bugs, okay? Roots. No, ma'am? 
Roots. 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 Ding, 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 ding. Who, 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 who doesn't have Osmocote? Who said Roots or doesn't have Osmocote? So, all right, Roots. How many people at the end of the season pull up their tomato plants or their okra plants or their broccoli plants? How many people pull those things up and look at the roots? Yeah, what do they look like? They got knots all over them. They got nodules, okay? You know what those nodules are? They're nematodes, okay? Nematodes love tomatoes. Have y'all ever looked at a tomato pack? <clears throat> when you look at a tomato pack, it's got a whole bunch of letters on it. What do those letters tell you? Resistance to Tells you what? How resistant they are to disease. To different things. Versillium. Blah, I don't even remember them all, but one of them is N, and that is nematode. So nematode resistance. But let me tell you, nematodes are, are a tricky creature, and that they specialize in different areas. So you kind of have to learn what tomatoes resist the nematodes better, okay? Because a plant that is bound in, in nematodes is not going to uptake the water and the nutrients that it needs to support that plant. And, you know, like we say, tomato plants are big plants. I mean, they, they need that root system, right? Yeah. So by moving these plants around, <clears throat> the recommended is you don't garden nematode susceptible plants in the same area more than three years at a time. So you want to move to a complete different side of your garden. Now the nematodes are still over here, and they're going to find it. They'll eventually get there, but they're kind of like earthworms, okay? We'll talk about um, earthworms, and somebody once told me, I'll save the earthworm story. Okay. <laughs> Control weeds. Okay. Yes. How far apart, like say if you've got a, a vegetable that attracts you, you want to rotate. If you have a small garden, how far? So really as far as you can. Okay. okay. So my garden is 50 feet wide, 35 feet deep. Okay, so I flip my tomatoes, eat, I actually move my tomatoes year to year to year. So I'll be on the far side one year, next year I'll be on the, the other side. The next year I'll take it to the second row, the next year I'll take it back over to the fourth row. And so I'm, I, move, I move tomatoes around because tomatoes are so bad. Okra is another one. They love okra. So you kind of have to manage that as well. So that's why you have a garden journal? Well, if you have a garden journal, yes, you can take note of these things. And you primarily, when you take notes of these things, you can record varieties and you can find out which varieties of which are, are resistant to the nematodes, okay? Which ones do really well, especially if you have a nematode problem. Um, you know, one of the big things I, I say, you know, you're really into your tomatoes if you graft tomatoes. But do you know why people graft tomatoes? What? The rootstock resistance. Yes, the rootstock resistance. That's what they buy. They buy specific rootstock that will fight off the nematodes. Okay? So you have the Alright, so that's a very good answer. What if you have containers for your tomatoes? So if you have containers, man, you're lucky. Yeah. Because after two or three years, you need to throw that soil out anyway. Because, and I grow, this year I grew my tomatoes in, who knows what lick barrels are? Lick barrels. So, cattle, cattle ranchers feed minerals to their cattle in these great old big barrels now. And so that's what we grow our tomatoes in. But this is the true, whether it's a tomato, a petunia, a snapdragon, whatever you grow in a pot, that soil is going to become rapidly depleted of nutrients. So really you should throw that out every year at most every two or three years and, and start over, okay? Because it will rapidly break down. So we'll talk about some of this stuff too, but especially if you're going organic, the thing that tears organics up, which makes it hard for us down here, is heat, okay? So, um, so anyway, we'll talk about that. You want to control weeds. You know, you just want to give plants a nice, clean, safe place to live, all right? And certain weeds might bring in certain pests that are vectors of different things that you don't want there. Viruses. Viruses.
bacteria, funguses, okay? I'm sorry, any pathogen. Yes, ma'am. All right, another thing to control some of those pathogens that we're talking about. How many people have heard you say water in the morning? Now, why do they say that? Because, you know, people can get in <laughs> to make you appreciate gardening. Get up in the morning and water. But why do they tell you that? So that it can dry during the day. The what? Yes, ma'am. That do you have Osmocote? No. Okay. But do you know do you know why you get more funguses if you water in the evening? What is the scientific reason behind that? What is it? And they love moisture. Okay, they love water. That's how fungus. That's how most funguses exist. Okay, so you want to keep those plants as dry as possible. That's the other reason they tell you to water from the bottom, right? Okay. Here I. That's it. I get a little excited and I give my osmo cut away really fast. But this is a good. One. What is the only plant, only plant class that you should water from the top? rain. Okay, how many people realize that 80 to 90 percent of the roots in a tree that you can see don't do much for the tree. Okay, all those things do, they're anchoring it to the ground. The active growing roots, the only roots in a plant that take up water and nitrogen are white roots. And where do you find white roots in the plant? You find them at the drip line. And why are they at the drip line? Because that's how nature waters the tree. The tree hits it, it runs off, okay? We had not talked a lot about pest control. I'm going to have to move fast. Okay, plant many types of vegetables as opposed to a single type. Now, I know if you have a small garden, this might be a little bit more of a challenge, but I'm going to tell you a little story. Who's heard of the cucumber beetle? Do y'all have the cucumber beetles? Okay. I had never seen a cucumber beetle. And four or five years ago, ten years, I, I don't know, it all runs together. Sally and I love to decorate, you know, with for fall and for Christmas and all of that. And we love to grow the stuff that we decorate with. And so we were going to grow all of our fall decorations, and I brought all of these varieties of winter squash, you know, hard, hard winter squashes. So I planted a 50-foot row of winter squash, grow it up on cattle panels, and about the time those things got up and the flowers opened up, I started seeing this little green bug in mass. I don't mean I saw one or two. These suckers, they must have Facebook or something because they told all their friends, they came to my garden, and I'm telling y'all, they ate everything. They ate the flowers. They ate the leaves, they ate the pollen, <clears throat> and it was an interesting experiment. So obviously we didn't get a whole lot of hard red winter fruit, but we did get one pumpkin called the red warty thing that they didn't seem to bother. So, you know, so you can turn your failures into an experiment, and like you said, you're going to start gardening, journaling. That's, that would be an interesting thing to know, that, that, that for us, that pumpkin seemed to be somewhat naturally resistant to the cucumber beetle. All right, sp space plants properly. So when I talk about this, I tell people, when you buy a plant, and this is science and agriculture, I love the science and agriculture. So when you go and buy one of those little plants in a four inch pot, you're gonna notice two things. Number one, your four inch pot is gonna have a lip around it, right? It's gonna have a lip that's bigger than the bottom that's tapered to it. That lip's important, I'll tell you why in a minute. But it's also going to have a plant tag in it. All right? Read that plant tag, y'all. You know why? <laughs> 
somebody got a PhD <laughs> writing that plant tag. Right? So they know what they're talking about. Read those plant tags. Face your plants properly. Right? On the little left, on all pots. Science and agriculture. I love this. Do you know why almost all of your pots, your terracotta pots, your four-inch pots, all of them have that raised up lip that is larger than the rest of the pot? I only have 20 minutes old. Oh, <laughs> well, level you're supposed to fill the dirt up to? No, ma'am. Well, to the bottom of it. You're yeah. supposed to fill it up to the bottom of it. Yeah. Then, if you take like one of those little rain head sprayers, like you work in a greenhouse or whatever, and you're watering your plants with one of those diffused sprayers, if you fill that pot to the, where the water comes up to the top of that lip, and walk away, that is exactly enough water to drench the soil in the bottom part of that pot. Science and agriculture. Maybe I, that's what I should change this to. Alright, space plants properly. That video I told you I saw about the tomato plants where they were all crammed together and everything, what's the problem with that? Why did those tomatoes have so many bugs on them when the other ones didn't? They were, what's that? The plants are too close and have air they, they do not get the air, but think about what this does for the bugs. You just made a bug superhighway. Okay? All of these plants touch each other. And so did you know how what is the organic control method for aphids? Water. Spraying water. Now why? Why do you think that works? Why, I mean, why don't they just get up and walk back up? <laughs> they can't. Okay? They don't, they don't have enough strength. These things are bred on that leaf. They're designed to live on that leaf and live on that stem. And if you knock them down, they do not have... I mean, I'm not saying none of them can walk back up. But pretty much, they can't get back up the plant stalk, okay? So... That is why we space plants properly. If two tomato plants are touching and an aphid goes from this leaf and there's a leaf right here, it's now on that tomato plant. So that's why we space them properly. Clean up mulch and debris. Y'all, this was very interesting to me. I talked to several of y'all tonight before we got started and I, I listen when I go to these things because I have to write articles that you know, keep y'all interested. And one thing that seems to be very popular right now are pollinator gardens. A lot of talk about pollinator gardens. So a couple weeks ago, oh yeah, I've got to tell you all this. Follow us on social media, um, Texas Gardener Magazine on Facebook and on Instagram. We put out tips um, every Wednesday. And so you can follow us there. So I put out a thing the other day. Don't waste your leaves, you know, rake your leaves up. They are incredible to add to your mulch, to your gardens, um, to your compost and all that. And I don't know, two or three people left comments on it, and they said, well, why don't you leave them alone so that the pollinators can overwinter them? Well, and that was very interesting to me. So I, I hadn't thought about that, because the reason we tell you to clean up mulch and debris is the same reason that they tell you to clean up the leaves in your yard because things do overwinter in them, okay? So one thing that's fascinating to me is my wife and I have a screened-in porch. So every January, we can go out on that screened-in porch. There's not a bug out there. Okay, yeah, there's not a bug out there. You know, it's, it's great. But as soon as it warms up, come March or April, there are full-grown yellow jackets and red wasps and mud daubers buzzing around on that porch. And that was very interesting to me, you know. It's because they find places to overwinter. And so a lot of these plants do overwinter. Some of them even lay eggs that lay dormant in that. And so I tell people, clean up your garden, okay? Clean, clean it up. Don't leave dead and decaying leaves in there. Clean it up. Evidently, if you're a pollinator person, then you need to find a corner somewhere away from your garden and pile all of that up and, and let the pollinators overwinter their eggs and all there. But um, anyway, but that's why I tell people to clean up. Animals do overwinter there. Okay, January, everybody's like, we're working on the January magazine. What do you do in January? Well, you read gardening magazines, you buy seed catalogs, 
And what you should do is you should go out there and tune up your tiller and your mower and sharpen and clean your tools, okay? And then, so one thing that I truly love, I love flowers. I grow tons and tons of flowers. Well, when you're harvesting, you also want to be careful and you want to keep a 1% bleach solution with you when you're harvesting things to make sure that if there is any fungicides out there, that you will be killing those and not spreading those to plants as well. And you need to sanitize everything. I, I focus on my hand tools, but if you use tomato steaks or cages, wash them down too. 1% bleach solution is sufficient. Okay, mechanical and physical control methods. This is where we've moved up the triangle to now. When you're doing those cultural methods at the bottom, you're trying to control them. You're trying to stop them from getting started. Okay? Now as we've moved up, we've got bugs. We've got a problem. And so there are a lot of things that we can do. <clears throat> the best thing you can do is observe. You know... There's nothing better. I, I love little gardening sands, and truly, I, I believe this sand. The best thing a gardener can put in their garden is their shadow, okay? So you need to be out there. You need to be looking. You need to be pulling the leaves back on these things, all right? How many of y'all have squash vine borer down here? Yes. 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 Hate the squash vine borer. You know, just when your squash looks its best, these things will, you know, knock them down. Overnight. They're horrible, horrible. But if you're out in your garden... You can hear them. Have y'all ever heard them? Have y'all ever been out there? Man, if you'll get out there and you'll listen, they sound like an airplane. They're like, Bzzz. I mean, they really, really make the noise. And so once you hear them, you know, I've got a squash vine borer around. So where does a squash vine borer lay her eggs? She lays them under the leaves and kind of at the base of the stems, at the petioles. And so when those little caterpillars hatch out, they don't have very far to crawl to get down there, and then they burrow inside the stem of the plant, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're out in your garden and you hear her, then you know to start looking for her. Because a lot of times we don't know when these pests are there. They don't live there. These pests, you know, they're, they pass through. Get your back well, you could, but if you can catch her in a vacuum, you're doing really good. Well, she's, she's fast and, and she flies, but... But anyway, get out there and pay attention. Watch for the bugs, okay? Because another thing that I will tell people, and I've gotten into this with a lot of people, you know, oh, you just can't control leaf bugs with organic matter, or with organic methods. Well, I'll say this. It's very hard to control mature leaf-footed bugs with organic methods. However, if you catch them when they're small, if you know what they look like and you catch them when they're small, well, then BT will sometimes work, okay? And, but you've got to catch them early, and generally with organic, you have to apply more than once. So you just have to be willing that if you're going to commit to an organic control program, you're going to have to be on top of things, and you're going to have to treat more than once, all right? So the easiest way, pick them off. Drop them in soapy water. Another scientific thing, everybody says, every recipe you hear organic or whatever, put dish soap in it. Why do you put dish soap in all of this stuff? It's what is it? Well, it is, it is, it's called a suffocant, or an emulsifier. So an emulsifier is something that allows the solution to mix better, but what a suffocant does, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to break the surface tension of the water. Okay, so when you put that in, when you break the surface tension in the water, so here is my friend Patty who, who writes for us. This is when she went out and picked harlequin bugs off of her broccoli. Okay, she put soapy water in there because if they don't, those bugs can walk on the surface of the water. But if you put the soap in, it is a suffocant, it breaks the surface tension, they will drop and they will drown. Okay, when we go and we make our organic sprays that we're going to talk about in a minute, you put the dishwater in there because then when it breaks that surface tension, instead of hitting a bug with one blob of your stuff that's this big, you're going to hit them with 10 things that are this big. So you're going to coat them and cover them better. So dish soap is a very good thing to add to all of your organic recipes, whatever it is that you have. 
So be on the lookout, remove eggs from the underside of your leaves, spray aphids and scales with water. And I will tell you, scales, do y'all have crepe myrtle bark scale down here yet? Yeah, yes. scales are very hard to control with just water. I mean, I, I really want to change that. They need a horticultural oil of some, some type to smother them, okay? But aphids you can kind of control with water. But even then, you have to get up under the plant, okay? How many of y'all have a water hose that squirts up? You know? Yeah, so I mean, you either have to get some kind of handheld nozzle I actually have a device a guy here in Texas made called the Mighty, Mighty Fine Mister. And it's a aluminum tube that he put like a nozzle like you have on a power washer. And, you know, so you hook it up to your hose and it's got a valve on it and it's designed to spray up under your plants, you know. So in that, you really do need something like that if you're going to control the aphids primarily. Mechanical barriers and row cover. Okay, at my house, Everybody's got their favorite pest, right? My favorite pest at my house is Gaius domestica. Right? How many of y'all have Gaius domestica? <laughs> Who can tell me what Gaius domestica is? What? No, but a lot of women think Gaius domestica is smarter than us. Here, you're in trouble. I'm going to get you Okay. Gaius domestica is the common chicken. All right? So, my wife and I, we don't have cats and dogs, we got chickens. We love our chickens, okay? But they are horrible, horrible in the vegetable garden, in any garden. Because they dig, and they dig, and they dig, and they don't dig weeds, they only dig the stuff to care about, okay? So, another problem that we have is, as my wife has gotten older, I tease her, and she gets just a little more Buddhist every year, okay? And what I mean by that is she has a strict no-kill policy in our house. And because she has a strict no-kill policy, we have one of the finest populations of cottontail rabbits and We have incredible little bunnies. Now, because of the chickens and the bunnies, it really has almost gotten to the point where I cannot grow without some kind of mechanical barrier or row cover. All right? I started using these three or four years ago. Um, I use a very lightweight fabric. Your row covers come in different weights. It'll be how much they weigh per square foot or something. And so I use a very lightweight cover where I'm at that's generally good enough. But I'm telling you, if you want to grow picture quality vegetables, or even ornamental, but primarily use these in the vegetable garden, use some kind of row cover, okay? Because it is going to keep the bugs off. Um, it's also going to give them a nice environment, especially in the fall garden, okay? It's going to make sure that they have a little additional heat in there and all. So the only problem, what's the only problem with a mechanical barrier or a row cover? Yeah. Well, yeah, you do have to secure them. I mean, and that is, I mean, I secure mine with rebar. So I buy a half-inch rebar, run it down the sides of it, roll the row cover up in it, and that's how I secure mine. Oh, I got five minutes, man. Y'all aren't going to get the whole presentation. So, but anyhow. Um, we'll let you go back. Keep going. Okay. So you have to make sure your flowers get pollinated, right? So if you've got this row cover, you're going to keep the pollinators out. So if you're going to use a, a row cover fabric, you're going to have to roll it up when the weather's nice and let the bugs get in there and, and pollinate it, okay? And just real quick on the, um, on the squash vine borer. <coughs> row cover works great for the squash vine borer, especially because you can hand pollinate squash, which is it's very, very easy thing to do is hand pollinate squash. But the other thing that if you can grow that squash until it flowers and it is ready to be pollinated, you can then take the row cover off because generally at that point, if the borer attacks at that point, the plant is far enough along and big enough that it can survive the attack. So that, that's just a little... I love squash, but I mean, we really are plagued with the borer. Are there any varieties that are resistant to the squash borer? So, there are no, like, yellow squash, yellow crookneck, zucchini, things like that. None of those are resistant to it, but all of the hard 
winter squashes. But they call it winter squash. I mean, you can plant them in the spring, too. Acorn. But they are resistant. I'm sorry? Acorn. Acorn. Acorn, Turk's cab, red warty thing. You know, there's, there's a million of them, all right? Um, and why are they? Why are they resistant to it? No, I think they taste great. I love them. I've been to the bugs. Oh, no, no, they don't taste good the bugs. But, so, have you noticed how your squash grows? Your squash grows just like celery, okay? It's got its roots right here. It shoots up these stalks, and those stalks are very big, and they're very hollow. So it's very easy for that bug to burrow in there, work its way up and down, kill all of the xylem and phloem in the plant, which is what kills it. They truly destroy the vascular system of, of the plant. All these winter squashes are binding squashes. And they got thick skin. They do have thick skins, but the other thing that they have, which is much more important, is they vine. And any crop that vines generally will root at a node. So as these things are growing, if you let them grow along the ground, they're going to root at the node and they're going to send something up. And so even if a squash vine borer gets in there, they're only going to affect a small part of that plant. Okay? So. All, all vining plants are resistant to the board. So, all right, traps. Guys, this one's just for you. Guys like to make stuff, right? I mean, that's what we're known for, you know. We, we like to get out there and do stuff. You can make all kinds of cool bug traps. One of my absolute favorite is get you a wash tub, fill it up with water, put soap in it, and then somehow get you a stake to put behind it and put a light on it and let that light run at night and when you come in in the morning that water is going to be covered with dead bugs all right so there are all kinds of traps that you can you can do like that i mean some of the more common are if you've got slugs put beer in a, a saucer and, and things like that but drown the suckers okay um light Attracts them at night. The soap is a suffocant. Yes, ma'am. Sticky. All right. Now, my absolute favorite um, bug control method are yellow sticky traps. How many people have ever been to a greenhouse? I said we're going to do things like a greenhouse. How many of y'all have ever been to a greenhouse? I've heard many of y'all say that y'all work with children. If you want a great field trip, call some commercial grower and go to a greenhouse. They are fascinating. And they truly are science, okay? Yellow sticky traps. If you'll go through, like, okay, when I was in graduate school, everybody had to grow poinsettias. And the reason we had to grow poinsettias, you can learn a whole lot, but a &M sells them. So that's why we had to grow poinsettias. Well, every poinsettia had a little yellow sticky trap that they would stick down in the pot to catch the bugs. Now, I told you that there was science in agriculture. Everything that I tell you here has a scientific backing. Uh -huh. Why do you think all yellow sticky traps, or all sticky traps are yellow? Lost color. Flower is yellow. Flower is yellow. All right, who needs osmocote? I got lots of. Uh, here, I, I got more, ladies. Uh, yellow is the primary color of flowers in the world. So almost every insect, and, and it has to do, number one, this is interesting too, the bugs don't know it's yellow, okay? I want you to know that bugs do not see like we do, okay? So bugs see differently, but the color that we see as yellow is more flowers in the world are yellow than any other color, all right? There, there is a yellow rose in Texas. But I mean, think about it. Think about marigolds and carnations. And I mean, gardens, a lot of times, they have a lot of yellow in them. All right, chemical and biological control methods. I tell people we're going to use these as a last resort, and we're going to use them sparingly. Because people, a lot of people I talk to think that an organic poison is better than a commercial poison. But let me tell you, the word poison is not a good word. <laughs> poison is poison. I don't care if it's organic or if it's made in a factory. It's poison, and it's going to kill stuff. And so it will kill your, your beneficials, your pollinators.
alligators, just like it doesn't kill whatever bug you're trying to con control. So just be aware of that. BT. Everybody's heard of BT, right? What do you use BT on? Yeah, soft body. Anything soft body. Now, even then, you want to apply BT when these caterpillars are first born for it to be most effective. Okay, so you're going to spray it. And like I said, you're going to spray it often. So chemical, fertilizer, chemical pesticide, you can spray, and that will have a you know, two, three-week efficacy. The bad thing about all organic pesticides is they are very sensitive to heat and light. So when you use an organic method like um, spinosad or BT, always mix a single serve application because in 24 hours, if that stuff gets above 67 degrees in 24 hours, it's inert. Okay, it's dead. It's not. It's just water with some milky stuff in it. All right. So. Single use, make small batches, mix it frequently and put it out. You probably, to get good control with either of those products, I recommend spraying at least three times. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So on the BT, specifically it's for the Janista caterpillar. The what? The Janista caterpillar that affects the Texas mountain laurel. Uh-huh. Um, if you were to use BT on your, or you just spray your tree tips where the caterpillar, you have to physically... Spray it on the caterpillar, or can you spray it on the leaf? Right, the because they do. They ingest this, it gets in, and it messes up their digestion. Mm -hmm. So, yes, ma'am. So, again, breaks down in the heat. Spinosad is one of them. Spinosad is one of them that they say you can use for fire ants. I can tell you, there's nothing you can use for fire ants. <laughs> you, you can spray them. It might move them around or whatever. But it will kill bees. You know, boiling water, it's, it's kind of like anything else. I think it ticks them off. And, uh, and it, yeah, it, it makes them move or, or whatever. But I don't think boiling water is very effective. So, so anyway, so these are some of the chemical biological control methods. Neem oil. I love neem oil. Okay. We'll talk about here in a little bit why some of these things work. Bugs... A lot of predators, a lot of bugs don't like the way it smells. I am six over, or I've got six no, million. Right over? No, we don't have it's seven o'clock. Seven hundred up. Okay. So, oils, 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 oils. Oils are effective on scales, and they are also they will suffocate scales and aphids if they get on them. But they also, by their very smell, will discern will deter certain predators or certain pests, okay? You can introduce um, bugs. I don't recommend introducing bugs. Okay, there's a ladybug out right now called an Asiatic ladybug. It's more orange or yellow or whatever. And I mean, it's as mean as a ladybug can get, you know? I mean, it can bite you and it can, you can feel a little prick when it bites you. But these are not native. These were introduced. You know where they came from? They came from your garden center, where you went there and you bought the little cottage cheese containers full of ladybugs and everybody turned them loose. These are not a native predator to our area, so we really don't know what the effects of them are going to be. Instead, grow a garden that encourages the ladybugs to come in and the praying mantis. Don't go buy something from China, okay? I mean, truly, we, we don't know the consequences. All right, finally, we have homemade concoctions, and we'll go through this real quick. I like to tell people... For some more Osmocote, I'm getting close to the bottom. <laughs> I can tell you, if you want to grow a weed-free or a pest-free garden, I can tell you one plant family that you can grow and you will have no pests. Anybody want to guess? That's the AC family. <laughs> Basil. No. Herbs. They, I mean, they're, 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 I'm sorry? Ding, 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 ding. Ding, 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 ding. A liam. Okay? Woohoo! Oh, we got a no. A liam. Okay? Anything in the garlic, onion, leek, shallot family. Okay? Nothing eats them but gophers. Okay? Deer don't like them. Pests don't like them. They truly do not like the smell. Okay? It's the smell. So 
So if you'll notice, any homemade concoction that you have, um, it'll say mix up onions or, you know, peppers. Forget the peppers. I mean, you can put the peppers. Some things don't like capsaicin, but by and large, birds, most birds are immune to capsaicin. It doesn't stop them. But onions and garlic and all of that stuff does. They don't like it. Okay? I tell people, if a deer won't eat it, then you're in pretty good shape. So, um, these are the things that we have out here that this is what you're going to use categories of things to make it. It really doesn't matter your recipe. You know, my mother, how many people know Dr. Bill Welch? You know, incredible horticulturalist. He, you know, he writes for the magazine. Lovely, lovely man. My mother heard him speak. And so she calls me. What is Dr. Welch's recipe for uh, a bug juice, you know? Uh, okay, mother. And I, I don't remember what I called her. I said, boil some onions and put some soap in it and some oil. Well, that is the recipe. That's everybody's recipe. All right, so we're going to run through this one very quickly. To me, the second most important thing, you want to you want to avoid herb or, um, herbicides. So once again, blah, 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 blah. You can control weeds in your garden organically, and it's very simple. It is so, so simple, okay? It's very simple to control. First of all, here's your cultural controls. Do not leave, let weeds go to seed. Who's heard that old saying? One year of weeds, me or one year of seeds means seven years of weeds, right? <laughs> Y'all, I have a horrible plant at my house. It's a beautiful plant, but it's a horrible plant. And it is called purple bindweed. Or y'all, y'all have purple bindweed? If you grew cotton, if you were in a cotton growing area, you have bindweed. Bindweed is a Texas native morning glory, and its seeds, they have verified that its seeds can lay dormant in the soil for over 20 years. Okay? So you don't want to let your weeds go to seed. Um, now, this kind of flies in the face of what we were saying earlier about space your plants properly. But if you can place things fairly close together, and certain like flowers and things like this, most edibles need to be kind of have their own room to grow. But a lot of flowers, you know, you said the Asteraceae family, asters and things like that, they're perfectly fine to run into each other and all. And they will shed, they will keep sunlight from hitting the soil. Who else has heard the saying that wherever the sun touches the soil, God plants a seed? Right? That is a true statement. What? I don't know what else I've got up there. Okay, drip irrigation. So let's talk about this real quick. What does every living thing on the planet need to live? Water. Water. Oxygen. Air. And then food or some kind of nutrients, okay? So the way organic weed control works is we are going to control those three things. All you have to do is control one of them, and you'll kill stuff, okay? I promise you that if somebody deprives you of air, they will kill you, okay? So this is just good, basic science. And people, you just need to think through this. Why do people love drip irrigation? Now, I'm sorry? It, does, it helps control the weeds. So when you have drip irrigation, I mean, water is also a big problem in Texas that we still are concerned about. And so it is primarily water savings. But if water is not hitting your whole garden, hitting your whole row, then the weeds aren't going to have stuff to grow in. Okay? They're just not going to get the water they need. Now, here's the other thing. My second favorite word in gardening, what did we say my first favorite word was? <laughs> Compost. My second favorite word is mulch. mulch, okay? What is the difference between compost and mulch? Six months. Who said that? So, six months, okay? That's the only difference. Mulch, 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 okay? So mulch will build your soil, which is a good thing, but what else, what does it deprive the weeds of? Sunlight. Sunlight. Okay, remember that thing, wherever the sun hits the soil, God plants a seed? Don't let the sun hit the soil. Okay? And you can use so many things for mulch. Some of the things I do a lot, newspaper. We will put down newspaper and then I'll mulch on top of it. I also love cardboard. My wife and I go to our recycle center all the time. 
I always have tons of cardboard. I go, I put it down, and then I mulch over the top of it. In six months, the cardboard's gone. You know, the mulch is gone. It's time to do it again. Mulch, 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 mulch. All right. Mechanical, physical control methods of weed control. Solarization. What is solarization? Plastic covering. It's what? Plastic covering on the ground. And why? To block the sunlight? No, sir. I, I don't like to say no. Yes, sir. That that's a good that is a good reason. Okay. Elevate the temperature. Typically, we're gonna talk what you're talking about is the next one is smothering, and we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But you get some awesome code. <laughs> so the uh just throw it. Up the soil so nothing grows. Thanks. Ding 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 ding. Ding, 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 ding. Do you have Osmocote? I do. Okay. I'm going to tell you a magic number. I'm going to tell you a magic number. Write this number down. This is the most magic number in horticulture. 140. You know what 140 is? It is degrees. It's what? That's the right thing. Ding, 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 ding. Do you have Osmocote? No, I do not. 140 degrees. It does two magical things for us. Number one, 140 degrees will kill 90% of the seeds that are in your seed bed that are in your soil. Okay? So that is why solarization is so effective, is that you're raising things above its ability to live. Okay? If they put us on the sun, we would not live. And that's what you're doing to the seed. 140 degrees. You know what else? Uh, the other magical thing that it does for us? If you are actively working your comp, do you have? <laughs> if you are actively working your compost pile, what happens to your compost pile when you add greens to your brown? It heats up. What temperature do you think it heats up to? 140 degrees. Okay, 140 degrees. That's a very big number. All right. So solarization kills the weed seeds by cooking them. Finally, the next one is smothering. So that's what you were talking about. Smothering denies them light. Right? And smothering is very effective. Who wants to know what the most effective smothering agent is? Plastic. Rubber. Well, there's certain plastics. Rubber is good. Party plank. Wood. But I can tell you the most effective smothering agent I've ever found is a 40-foot shipping container. So, <laughs> when my wife and I remodeled our house, we put a 40 foot shipping container in our backyard so we could move all of our junk in it while we were remodeling. The remodel took over a year. By the time we moved everything back in the house, hauled the shipping container off, for three or four years we had a 40 foot rectangle in our backyard. Okay? So, smothering agents are very, very effective. Oh, and fire. This is my fun. Could you use fun. tarps? Yes, ma'am. Anything that blocks the sun. Okay, but with a smothering agent, you really kind of want something that's going to have some weight and it's going to stay in place because tarps can get holes in them. They can blow off and things like that. So you really need to deprive them of the light. Yes, ma'am. So, like, if you have hardy plank, that's really a good one. You know, a hardy plank, it comes in about 12-inch sheets, too, so it really fits nice in beds and things like that if you get some of that. All right, finally, this is it. We're going to wrap it up. Fire. I love fire. How many people are... I love fire. I'll just say it. I love fire, okay? So, my wife and I have hundreds of feet of decomposed granite walk paths on our property. All right? Nobody told me when I put down that granite that decomposed granite is the ideal germination medium for just about every wart weed on the planet. Okay? So, since I don't like to spray herbicides, I thought, man, I'm, I'm going to burn these suckers, okay? And so I looked into it. Fire is a very effective control method. What you're trying to do is all plants have what is called a cuticle, correct? You're aware of the structure of the plant, the leaf, things like that. They have a cuticle, a waxy substance that keeps all of their good um, liquid goop in, right? All you have to do with fire is you just have to raise the temperature enough to break down that cuticle, and then the plant will respire itself to death. It will literally, it won't be able to keep the moisture in, okay? 
Now, it's a weed. What is, what is, I'm sorry? I said, she says, oh, I said, it's a weed. <laughs> All right, so what did I tell y'all was my second favorite word, horticultural mulch. word? Mulch. Uh, mulch, 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 mulch. Okay, I mulch my vegetable garden with old spent hay. All right? And I use old spent coastal Bermuda hay. And everybody's like, don't you get weeds? Doesn't that Bermuda spread? Blah, 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 blah. How many people know that all agricultural Bermudas are sterile? Did you know that? They physically cannot produce seeds. All right? So if you get good old dead Bermuda hay, it's not going to, you're not going to get an infestation of Bermuda in your grass. So anyway, I mulch all of my beds with hay, dry hay. Well, let me tell you what I learned a couple of years ago. Is that hay mulch and a big, um, y'all know what a pad burner is? You know, in South Texas, they have these propane things, these big heads to burn the nopales and everything. Well, pad burners and Bermuda grass mulch do not go well together. Okay? So I was out, I was burning the weeds on my decomposed granite, and I don't know what happened. And I turned around and did this for just a second. And my tomato row went up in smoke. And I'm screaming at my wife, and she's a very loving and understanding woman. And I said, oh my God, I've caught the tomatoes on fire. And you know what she said to me? She said, how many degrees do you have? <laughs> Boy, okay. And that was a stupid thing to do. Don't use fire around your straw mulch, okay? All right. Some more chemical control methods, and then we're going to finish up. The roundup of the organic world is acetic acid. What is acetic acid? Vinegar. 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 All right? But is it household vinegar that I'm talking about? No. 10%. No. Horticultural acetic acid. So it comes in all different concentrations. Household vinegar is 6 to 7%. But acetic acid that you get at your nursery is 20 to 30 percent. Now, I use 30 percent, but I'm used to this stuff. I want you to know that 30 percent acetic acid is almost as effective as Roundup. It will kill. It will kill very quickly. It will kill your beneficials, too. Can you plant it? Yes. Seven days, it is completely gone. Okay? So, horticultural acetic acid. Best thing, literally the best weed control thing on the planet. And then finally, ma'am, just for you, I put boiling water up here. But, yeah, really. I mean, boiling water is how hot? 212 degrees, right? How hot does it get here? 110. The concrete heats up. Boiling water is not a very effective thing here. Um, I will tell you one other thing that I don't know why it's not in the presentation. I have found an organic thing to kill nutgrass. Okay? So, everybody hates nutgrass. It is called horticultural molasses. So it truly is just a cane molasses that is highly concentrated like the acetic acid. And so I read this, and, and this is what I encourage people to do. Try stuff. When you find stuff, try it, okay? And so I went and bought a can of or a bottle, it was a plastic bottle of this stuff about this big, about this big around, cost about $20. And so I had some nut grass right outside the back door, so every day I would go out and I would pour that horticultural molasses on that nut grass. And after about 10 days and $20 worth of molasses, I killed that nut grass right there, okay? So, I'm going to tell you, it's just not much good for night groups. All right. Y'all, that's it. I do appreciate it. I'm sorry I went long. Um, but, anyway, Sally and I will be in the back. I know y'all have a meeting to do, so I don't know if y'all break now or who. Or y'all go straight into the meeting. <laughs> If you have any questions about gardening in general or this video specifically, please contact our Bear County Master Gardener helpline. If you'd like more information about becoming a Bear County Master Gardener, then please check out our website. If you'd like to know more about the Texas Master Gardener Association, then please check out our state's website.